and good morning to all the new faces out there. I see a few that I don't know. You're welcome to the place. I hope you enjoy this morning's service. Well, we'll pick up where we left off last week. And we've been going through the connections, if you like. It's the return to the land. And it's looking at the connections between the books of Joel, Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So obviously, they're not being done in depth. There are key verses which will be mentioned. And the main thrust is the connection between the books so that we can start to see the Bible as a whole, not as a series of discrete individual little books that all tell us a little something. It's all part of God's plan of redemption. And that starts in Genesis and finishes in Revelation. Okay, so last week, we finished up at the point where Zerubbabel and his team have been working on the rebuilding of the temple. And they've struck some opposition. And the opposition came from those who later became known as the Samaritans. First, they tried to discourage the people of Judah. Then they troubled them while they were building. And then they hired counsellors to lobby against Israel with the kings of Persia to frustrate the Jews through the use of scare tactics. And in effect, it worked. Because the king of the time issued a decree <clears throat> that the work was to stop. And it did for 14 years. And in those 14 years, some things happened. The returning remnant built houses for themselves. As some of them, those who are a little more wealthier than the others, some of them were quite palatial. And that's where the prophets Haggai and Zechariah come in, Haggai in particular. And we read in Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. At the same time, more opposition, Tatanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, as beyond the river Euphrates, he's talking now about the areas that are covered by Syria, Israel, Lebanon, and so on. And Shetha Bosnai, and their companions came to them and spoke to them thus, Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? And Tatanoi sent a letter to Darius the king, seeking verification that Zerubbabel had been given permission to return and rebuild the temple. So Darius caused a diligent search to be made, and they found the original decree of Cyrus in 537 of saying, yes, you can go back. Now, remember I said that Cyrus was mentioned in Isaiah 200 years before he was born. Daniel, who was the number two in the uh, kingdom, he showed that prophecy to, to Cyrus and Cyrus took it to heart. In fact, so much so that he referred to the God of Israel as the God. And so he gave permission for the return and the rebuilding of the temple. So in the reply from Darius back to Tatanoi, the wording of 
Cyrus's decree is included. But Darius goes a little bit further. And in Ezra 6, verse 6, Now therefore Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethabosnai and your companions, the Persians who were beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so they are not hindered. And whatever they need, young bulls, rams and lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine and oil, according to the request of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I issue a decree that whoever alters this edict, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it, and let his house be made a refuge heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it, or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree, let it be done diligently. Well, their whole scheme backfired well and truly, didn't it? Not only were they told to leave them alone, they were also told, you're going to supply all the money and all the goods and all the building materials that they need to do it. And if you want to change that, I'm going to have a plank pulled out of your house and you'll be hung on it. Now, that sounds like hang by the neck. No, no, no. Hanging to the Persians was to drop you onto a pointed stake. It's the earlier form of crucifixion. The Romans turned it into an art. That the Persians just dropped you onto a pointed stake. That's what it means when it says you'd be hung on the, on the timber. That's quite a nasty way to die. So there's no way that Tat and I and his mates are going to disobey what Darius has said. And so they did all that they were supposed to do, and the temple was finished, actually in 516 BC, it was finished and it was dedicated. When it was dedicated, according to Ezra 619, the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Now the Passover probably hadn't been celebrated for many, many years. Certainly not during the exile, because technically the Passover festival of the nation could only be held at the temple or in Jerusalem. So that was a big deal as far as they were concerned. The temple was finished probably 20 odd years after the laying of the foundation. Compared to the temple built by Solomon, this was a pretty poor facsimile, but God was with them and he promised to be there. That's the same temple that existed when Jesus walked the earth. But according to the New Testament, the temple was a glorious building. We find that Herod the Great, or as our guide in Israel said, he's Herod the Great, but not the Beloved. Herod had the temple modified, glorified, refurbished, however you like to put it, and he turned it into a pretty glorious sort of a temple. But it was the basic of it was still the temple that was built by Zerubbabel. You know, today in many churches, fellowships, denominations, schools, even whole countries of Christendom, 
A comparison not unlike the decline from Solomon's time to Ezra's is apparent. Faith, however, has to do with unseen things. And it could thus recall to the mind of this feeble remnant that Jehovah was no less mighty and no less merciful for them than what he was for Solomon. We could say the same today. We may not see the glory of the church as we thought it was 50, 60, 70 years ago with the influence that it had in society. But never forget that God is still with us. God doesn't change. He is faithful. He says in Malachi 4, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. And of course, in Hebrews 13, 5, we get Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in James, he is the same. There's no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. The God that was with Ezra and with Solomon and with David is with us today. Never, ever doubt that. Anyway, we'll look at the next one. I hope. That's from uh, Sidlow Baxter in uh, Explore the Book. And Ezra chapters 1 to 6, which covers the return of Zerubbabel, the first return. You get the return to the land is covered in chapters 1 and 2, and that's talking about basic rights. Or, if you like, better still, the right basics. They've got it right. In 3, 1 to 6, the altar is re-erected and the dedication renewed. In 3, 8 to 13, the new temple is begun. That's service and witness. Then they get the um, opposition. That's faith under testing. You know, sometimes when we go through difficulties, we think the Lord has left us and we want him to change the circumstances. No, 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 let the circumstances change us. What does God intend us to learn through difficult circumstances? It's faith under testing. Then the prophets exhorted them, so there's always a need for God's word. And nothing Satan likes better than for us to let dust to gather on the Bible. Always a need for God's word. And of course, when the temple was finished, faith had won through, and faith will always win through. Well, let's then have a look now at the prophets that are involved. Haggai returned from exile in Babylon under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua in 538 BC. When he starts to prophesy, it's now 520 BC. And of course, Cyrus is gone. He was moved by the prophecies about himself. And the restoration work continued under Cyrus and his successor, despite opposition from the Samaritans, although those foes of the Jews did obtain the edict that stalled it for 14 years. Haggai was now an old man. And in actual fact, his prophecy lasted only, or his term as a prophet, lasted four months. So listen, guys, just because you happen to be post-retirement, you might finish up having a ministry that only lasts four months. But what did that four months do? When a man speaks in the power of God, 
The effect cannot be measured by the length of service, but by the effect it produces in the hearers. Within three weeks of Haggai saying, you're building fancy houses for yourself. What about the house of the Lord? Within three weeks, they were back at work and they were building again. And so once again, we get a little bit of a, a look at the structure. Chapter one is the appeal and the response. Verses one to 11 is his admonishment for neglect. 12 to 15, the people repented and they purposed to carry on the work of building the temple. Then we get the contrast in chapter 2, 1 to 9. He talks of the contrast between the two temples. Firstly, in verses 1 to 3, as seen by the people, some of them shouted for joy. Some of them who were old men and had seen Solomon's temple wept because this new one fell far short of the glory of Solomon's temple. But then, as promised by God, that temple would be renewed and would be glorious, and it comes to a point where it's talking more about the heavenly temple when Christ returns than what it is about the physical temple that stands before them at that stage. Then there's another rebuke and encouragement again. He tells them why God's favor has been denied, how it can be restored. And then in chapter two, verses 20 to 23, he talks about the times of the end, the overthrow of the nations and the establishment of the house of David. Now, Haggai's prophecies can be dated precisely to the day. And that's because of the accuracy of Persian records. The general theme of the book of Haggai, short as it is, is put God first. And then, if you like, an outline of the four messages in Haggai, August the 29th, 520 BC, chapter 1, 1 to 15, was to arouse the people and build the house, build the temple. October the 17th, 2, 1 to 9, was God's message to the people. It's a message of support saying, I am with you as I was with Moses brought you out from Egypt. I was with you. I'm still with you. December the 18th was a message to confirm from this day, I will bless you. See, obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings problems. And then on December the 18th, a second one on the same day, to assure that in that day, I will make thee a signet. Now that's an interesting one, but we'll get to that in a minute. Because of the opposition and the discouragement, the Israelites had halted the mission to rebuild the temple for 16 years. Haggai revealed something that was holding them back. And in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, he said, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Hmm, that's what the people were saying. How many of us have used that same age old excuse? It's not the right time. Although God does have an appointed time for things. Sometimes we can use that truth to rationalize our behavior instead of submitting to Christ and what he's telling us to do. 
God's convicting response to the Israelites' excuse in Haggai 1.4 would probably sound today like, like this. You've got time for entertainment. You've got time for your career. Do you have time for my service? Now that's White's translation of, of what's in Haggai, but it's the same principle. You've got time to build yourself houses. You've got time to do this. You've got time to do that. What about my house? Put that into modern language. You've got time for entertainment. You've got time for your career. But do you have time for my service? So the message of Haggai overall is that God can always redirect us when we've forgotten our purpose. Are we focused on building the Lord's house or on our own? In other words, are we interested in building the kingdom? God's kingdom. What is God asking of us today? What's he asking of you? What's he asking of me? What's he asking of anyone that can hear this message? Is your life centered on Christ? And his missions. Allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen and encourage you. Jesus said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit and he will be your comforter and your teacher and your guide and he will show you things. Submit to him. Listen for that still small voice within. It is there, but you've got to listen for it. And that takes some effort because you've got the sounds of the world building into the ear. You've got all the things that you've, normal things of life. You've got dinner to make, you've got lectures to prepare, you've got cars to fix, or whatever it is. They're the normal things of life. But unless you make a specific effort to sit with the word and listen to what the word is saying, then you'll understand what Jesus said, he who hath an ear, let him hear. You're not talking about these flaps on the side of our head. He's talking about hearing in the heart. Your spiritual ears, if you like. Remember, no matter what the cost is to you, Jesus is worth it. It's only when we put the Lord first by completing the task that he set before us that we'll experience the fullness of his blessing. Indulgence of self and indifference to God may lead us to the same complacency that was evident in Haggai's day. The Lord requires holiness and obedience and the contamination of sin blocks the blessing of God. Now, I promised we'd talk about Zerubbabel as the signet. Now, that's a verse that's puzzles a lot of people. I'm not saying this is the answer, but it's what I think is the answer. In Haggai 2, 20 to 23, and again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the book of Chronicles, as I told you in the first session, the book of Chronicles, the book of Ezra, and the book of Nehemiah have lengthy genealogies and they were designed to determine who belonged to the kingly line of David and who belonged 
to the uh, Levites and the line of the high priests. Zerubbabel is actually the grandson of Jeconiah, the last of the line of the Davidic kings. He missed out on being slaughtered because he'd been taken to Babylon earlier. God always protects his property. Zerubbabel was his grandson. So Zerubbabel is in the line of David. And when you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and the genealogy of Jesus in Luke, you see that Zerubbabel is the link between the line of Solomon and the line of Nathan. The line of Solomon through Zerubbabel comes down to Joseph, which in natural terms gives Jesus the right to sit on the throne. And from David through his third son, remember Solomon was his second son, the first son died at eight days. Through Nathan, it comes down to Zerubbabel and out to Mary. And that gives him the purity of the line, if you like. So I believe that Zerubbabel here is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the prophecy, although he was a real man, and God would overthrow and destroy this world's Gentile kingdoms and set up Christ's millennial kingdom. And the signet ring was like the, well, it, it's, it's what it says. It's, it's a signature. And the signet ring, bang, that's it. That's an order from the king. The signet ring indicates that divine authority to rule is committed to the Messiah. Now, as I say, I don't know whether that's the answer, but that's the way I see it. And I, th I think I've, well, it's very brief, but I think I've argued it out fairly well, that he wasn't talking about Zerubbabel the man as being the signet of God's power, but Zerubbabel, because of the interrelationship between the two bloodlines, became the link, and therefore, the second link between those two lines is Jesus. So he's a type of Jesus. That was my reasoning anyway. I said we'd look at the prophets. Now, the next one is Zechariah. He's a much younger man than Haggai, but he was Haggai's contemporary and interested in the same effort of re-establishing the temple and the Jewish nation. But in contrast to the simple, straightforward language of Haggai, Zechariah's message uses a lot of symbols and figures to reinforce his message. But he did, especially in the first few chapters of the book, give encouragement to the governor Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua. Now, the first eight, chapter, eight chapters deal with the building of the temple. The rest of the book deals with prophecies after the temple has been built, especially relating to the first and second coming of the Messiah. So the book of Zechariah is like, if you like, it's in two parts. One lot dealing with what was then the present, the other lot dealing with what was the future to them. And the last chapter, I mean, you take the last chapter of Zechariah and put it up be beside the Revelation, and it's the same deal. So it's, it's, it's looking at what was then uh, present, what was to come in their future, and what is to come ultimately in the future of this world. The vision recorded in Zechariah 4, verses 6 to 10, promises that the mountain of opposition, which was probably that of Ezra 5, Tatanai and Co., will be removed and Zerubbabel will complete the work. And I think this is a key verse, not only for them, but for us. Zechariah 4, 6. 
So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I think that's the way that we should go about anything, whether it's church or whether it's even in our lives, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by his spirit. And in the spirit of God, there is might and power. Then continues, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Never think that it's a small thing if you start off in your service to the Lord by cleaning the church or even clean, cleaning the toilets. You know, that's a small thing, but who knows what it leads to. You learn service. You learn humility. And before you know where you are, you're a deacon. And so it goes on. Service to the Lord. Who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord's which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, is a call to return to the Lord. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers for whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. In other words, he's urging the people to how can I put it? Something that doesn't happen very often. Learn from the mistakes of those who preceded us. It's interesting, you know, a little aside, it's interesting when you look through what is taught in school now to what many of us learnt when we went to school. Remember learning all that British history? Why did we learn all that British history? Because we were British citizens. A lot of people don't understand that. Up until the 26th of January, 1949, we were all British citizens and we traveled on a British passport. But the Australian Citizenship Act of 1948, which came into force on the 26th of January, 1949, declared that everyone that was then born in or permanently resident in Australia and all Aborigines born after 1920 were then Australian citizens. That's why Australia Day is the 26th of January. Got nothing to do with the First Fleet. That's history. But if you don't look at history and you deny history, you're bound to repeat all the faults of it. You'll make the same mistakes as were made in the past. And that's what 
the prophets were saying, Haggai and Zechariah, Zechariah in particular, he's saying, don't forget the mistakes that your forebears made. Don't make the same mistakes. Learn from history. We got to do the same thing. We got to learn from history. See, if you don't learn from history, what happens when a nation turns its back on God? We see what happens to Israel. Learn from it. What's our nation doing at the moment? I believe the nation, as a nation, has turned its back on God. That is not a good place to be. Learn from history of what's been done when nations turn their back on God. Or worse still, when they think they are God. Anyway, <laughs> that's one of my hobby horses, I guess. I think we might leave it go at that rather than continue on and talking about. No, we won't. I can, I can go on another step further. There's a number of visions in Zechariah. And in chapter 1, 8 to 17, there's the vision of the four horses. That's followed by four horns and smiths. In chapter 2, there's the measuring line. In chapter 3, there's the reclothing of Joshua, where he's uh, given new clean robes of righteousness. The golden candle sta stand is explained in chapter 4. In 5, there's the roll, the ephah, and uh, mention of some women and so on. And a fourfold message then is the seventh vision. But between Zerubbabel and the book of Ezra, we'll go back to Ezra again yet, between Zerubbabel and Ezra, and the first ch six chapters of Ezra detail the first return, then the return under Ezra, which was 80 years later, is recorded. But in the intervening period, we have the story of Esther. And that might be where we take up next week the story of Esther and where it fits in with the books, the principal books anyway, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Father, I thank you that from your word we can realise that you are always with your people and, Lord, that we need to remember what happens when people turn their back on you. And Lord, maybe there no one under the sound of my voice that turns their back on you, but that they seek you with a whole heart. And Lord, when they seek you, I know because your word says so that you will be found of them. And Father, if no one has yet made a commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, Lord, I pray that you would move on them now and that such a commitment would be forthcoming because their eternal future relies on it. Amen.